Thank you very much for the opportunity talking uh, here today. And indeed, as you heard in the introduction, I'm doing computational biology, especially uh, machine learning and uh, deep learning applications in the field of uh, microscopy. Uh, and today I would like to start my presentation uh, with a small game. Uh, I will show you pictures and I will ask questions. And let's try to make it interactive and you will answer to me. Let's see. So if you see a picture like that, what do you think? What is on this picture? You have to speak louder. Water and rocks, they say. Okay, okay, water and rocks. Uh, is there anything else, for example, an animal? Yes, for Indeed, how many? Three. Oh, very good. What if what if it's not three but four? Is is that all? Do you see anything else? Uh, there is a small one. Uh, the right. Very good. Very good. Eye, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, to my knowledge, this is, this is all what you should see. So uh, imagine if uh, uh, you are about to write a uh, computer software where uh, you can you can ask such a question. How difficult it would be that I just show an arbitrary picture and I ask what's there even us humans it takes probably a minute to uh to find out what we see on the picture <clears throat> how about here do you see the dog on the uh, upper left image you immediately see right why because I, I gave you something this is called prior information because <clears throat> i shown you what to look for so if if we know what more or less what we are looking for then the question becomes much more easy and uh, um, this is something what i'm going to use in my entire presentation it's also called prior information so the more prior information we have about the system the more the easier it gets uh, to find a solution and then i i, I still have uh, two of these funny slides before i go to more difficult equations um, the next one is here my first question is, what is the question? <laughs> yeah. What is the shape the squares uh, form it? Or how many squares in, this, in the pictures? Not really, not really. The question, the question is, which, which square is bigger, uh, the one here or the one here? Yeah. And what is the answer? Yeah. Okay. So we all we all think they are the same, right? What if not? What if I just modified these squares a bit, and one of them is smaller? Can you see which one is smaller? No, probably you won't because they are the same. But uh, but but maybe I maybe maybe I could have let I could have let you believe that they are not the same because. They, the human eye is not really for quantitative like quantitative measurements in a way that 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 we can measure exact morphologies and my very last slide just there to speak in we we will uh we will count single cells actually single nuclei i will show you a microscopy picture and you should be very quick and tell me how many nuclei you see three two one start how many how many nuclei do we see? Eight, ten. Ten. Okay, eight, ten, something like that. Okay, plus minus plus plus minus ten percent is fine in biology, I think. So uh for a human it takes about four seconds. For my computer, it takes about 0 0.01 second. How about here? Sixteen. Very good. I, I also heard eighteen, probably. Let's stick with eighteen. Okay, and then uh, just to tell you, we have fantastic microscopes, large quantity of gigantic images, and uh, at some point you just say you don't want to count anymore. Um, right? 
So why why did I show you this couple of funny uh, slides instead of showing you some hardcore uh, science? I, I, I wanted to make um, a, a actually uh, a parallel comparison between humans and computers. And uh, what I conclude is humans are imprecise, humans are slow, but we are intelligent or you are intelligent you could see the horses right whereas computers are precise fast but and i i call them dummy so probably you you forgive me calling I, i'm a computer scientist so i know computers quite well and dummy is probably not the right word but what i wanted to rather say is that in my research we tried to we tried to put these red things together and and build precise fast and intelligent computational methods to process large quantities of data in the most precise manner. Uh, let me show you a video which actually justifies my my, um, uh, my statement here. So what you see here is 384 well plates, uh, each of which actually contains uh, actually 400 384 well plates where each well contains um, siRNA depleted single cells uh, where we created videos. So this was one of the first uh, image-based siRNA screens. Um, it's, it's, it's a whole genome-wide screen we did a couple of years before, uh, actually 10 years ago in, in Zurich. And the data amount, what we, what we acquired is 10 million images and 10 billion single cells. And the volume is is about uh, more than ten terabytes of data. So imagine if you need to solve such a um, uh, like analyze such such a data manually is is nearly impossible. And this is what my research groups are working on. So we try to we try to build uh, methods to work on image quality improvement, image segmentation, tracking, machine learning based single cell phenotyping to decide uh, about single cells, what type they are. And at the very end, if I'm going to have time, I want to show you uh, some very new developments, how to pick a single cell out of its native environment to do single cell proteomics or transcriptomics or whatever combined with morphology. So I'm, I'm basically going to guide you through these, uh, the, these couple of uh, points and show uh, the developments what we did recently. So firstly, about vignetting. So if you see a picture like this, you see um, couples, columns, that you see the beautiful sea, probably your eye does not recognize that the corner of the image and the middle of the image is so much different. Uh, if we would make a quantitative measurement, it actually turns out that the corners are three times darker than the middle, and it's still, this actually this represents the same sky. But because of the optical illumination, uh, it actually feels or, or or human eye is very much tuned to such things. Um, it, it, if you take a picture with your camera or your mobile phone whatsoever, uh, this often happens and we can compensate for that. Probably it's not a surprise that such distortions are also there in microscopy. And here are a couple of serious examples like a mouse kidney, yeast cells, cancer cells, and you can see how severe the illumination problem can get and uh, uh, how um, how much it can actually falsify the quantitative measurements. If you, for example, see the segmentation of the yeast cell here, and here we badly fail, or, or the cytoplasm segmentation of the cancer cells here and here, we basically could not do that. So we decided um, a few years ago uh, that we generate um, a method that actually calls for um, uh, like um, improving uh, this illumination problem phenomenon and created the software called CIDR um, that is a general illumination correction tool and you see the results of CIDR uh, it, it actually flattens and, and even for stitching you will not see much differences. Uh, so I promise this is the last equation I show in my presentation, but but let me just very briefly tell you uh, how the CIDR works. So you, you, you start with the reality, it's basically your sample, and then if you take a picture of it with a microscope, it goes through an optical system, a sensory system, which is usually uh, an objective and a CCD camera, 
and then you end up having the picture. This is not exactly the reality because throughout this way, it actually gets distorted. So what we said is if we would have infinite amount of these distorted pictures so that we, we uh, actually assume that objects are uniformly distributed across, then picking any point should have almost the same intensity distribution uh, actually almost the same, the almost is uh, the difference uh, caused by the illumination problems. And then we created models that, that try to estimate these illumination problems with a linear model <clears throat> and ended up having this uh, software called CIDR or other called CIDR that we tested on 12 different microscopy techniques. And it not it, it is not only outperforming the computational techniques, but also like, uh, like hardware calibration sites. So I should say that this is the state of the art at the moment to uh, correct for images and you can use it for epifluorescence price basically all type of microscopy more all, almost all type, type of microscopy you can imagine and you have implementations in in most of the programming languages including java matlab uh, python c plus plus and so okay so say we have flat images the next step is to use these flat images for quantitative analysis. So my group usually works on fluorescence images, but we also work a lot on, on uh, uh, other type of images. But if it if it's about fluorescence, then usually uh, they are, consists of uh, different fluorescent channels like the DAPI staining nuclei. Here we I, I will show you um, in the next couple of slides uh, an experiment where we were interested in uh, the infection of um, the influenza uh, virus uh, for different um, conditions or the cytoplasm, but the usual steps are that we detect the cells, we detect cellular compartments, and then we uh, extract features, basically numbers out of these. So the first step is that having a picture, we turn it into a so-called segmentation, where the segmentation means that we identify every single particle here, like in the nucleus, the cytoplasm, the virus particles, and then we have the so-called segmented image, which now contains um, uh, like the the partitioned uh, um, like entities in in the image. Then, if we want to convert these partitions into numbers, then we measure uh, certain properties like the morphology of the cell size of the cell, orientation, intensities, textures, like patterns of the cell. And basically, starting from a picture, we turn a picture into a matrix where, for example, each row is one cell, each column is one uh, property of that cell. And we are almost there. Um, this is this is what, what we wanted from image analysis, that we turn an image into something quantitative. Of course, my pathologist and biologist in the group would not be very happy if I give uh, 10, 10 billion times 200 matrices that this is the result for your experiment. So we need to probably post-process it a bit. But, but let's say at first, this is image processing. Um, actually, it's not true. Uh, because microscopy is very difficult. Often we have very serious problems with uh, image segmentation, and this is where my group is really interested in, is, for example, label-free microscopy, then fluorescence microscopy where cells are sitting on the top of each other, touching each other, and so on. And this is where we really uh, do a lot of, uh, a lot of research. So I cherry-picked you a few uh, examples what we did recently. The first, first one is uh, when cells are sitting on a top of each other and we would like to get them uh, single cell based analyzed and, and uh, all very accurately uh, detected. So if you see the, the left side of my uh, screen, you see a couple of cases that cells are on the top of each other. But if you look at it close, you, you will you will realize that there is an interesting property is that cells that are sitting on the top of each other, they are some, somewhat brighter. This is not a, a big magic. It's uh, it's uh, principles of fluorescence microscopy is that, that uh, fluorescence microscopy is an integrative technique. So if you have uh, twice as much fluor force, then you see twice as much intensities. So we said that <clears throat> we look for circular things Potentially, potentially they can overlap, 
but they can only overlap if there is a brighter region. And if you look at here, this is what we described with mathematical equations is that this situation is only allowed if there is a brighter spot. So with the, in this way, you can get very like uh, very detailed single cell analysis. <clears throat> you can also apply it on um, um, uh, sections like uh, HNA stained tissue sections, as you see here on breast cancer tissue uh, microarray spots. Oh, there is another very interesting problem we, we worked recently on is if cells are not really sitting on the top of each other, but heavily touching each other. Like here, you see a couple of cases of cancer cells. Uh, so if we model it mathematically, what we see is that there is the cell contour and all of a sudden there is a big break on the contour. We say that the curvature of the contour uh, suddenly goes up. And we said is if there is a situation like this, uh, actually two of them not very far from each other and their uh, normal vectors are aligned, then we could somehow split these situations because this is likely a single cell or two single cells touching. So we wrote a math mathematical model where we said that the, there is a contour, uh, it should go to the like edges of the cells. If there is no edge because they are touching each other, then we create an attractive force between the two ends of the contour so that they are forced to approach each other and cut. And you will see it here, or you will see it here as well, that uh, the, the, the contours are attracting each other and then, and then this cut appears. So this is very good. Now we have the single cell resolution segmentation. And so, so we developed such techniques during the last 15 years, and all of a sudden, uh, in 2018, there was a big data competition called the Kaggle Data Science Ball. Kaggle Data Science Ball is, um, is, is a yearly competition uh, where actually uh, real, real world problems are exposed to the community to solve. Um, and it's usually coming from the domain of defense, from submarine, from uh, space research. In 2018, it was about microscopy. And the task was to find uh, nuclei on diverse microscopy images. As you see here, the diversity was very big. It was most likely in, uh, inspired by cancer research. And uh, we said, OK, this is what we did in the last 10 years. So probably we should win this competition. And we went. And it actually turned out that this was probably the largest bioinformatics competition ever with uh, nearly 4,000 participants um, or participating groups, actually teams were like up to 10 people. So uh, we badly failed, actually. So our methods were in position 1,000 or something like that, which is putting 10 years research is quite, quite disappointing. So it turned out that this was pretty much the first occasion when people like started to use seriously deep learning in our field. And with deep learning, they, um, at least in the first 200 uh, groups were using deep learning very efficiently. Uh, so we also started to use deep learning and with that we could end up in being position 50 or so. So that's not, not that bad. It also turns out and probably many of you know that deep learning is super data hungry. So. If you want to make an efficient deep learning uh, uh, deep learning method, you need a lot of data. And for big providers like Facebook or Tesla, this is very accessible. For us, computational biologists, this is less. So what we said is that probably we could use another approach. And we started to experiment with something called image style transfer learning. Image style transfer learning is having uh, is a deep learning methodology where we have a basis, we have a style, and we can paint that basis uh, with a given style, or probably if I show you this picture here, there is a German city, famous painters paintings, and then as if the German city was painted by that uh, painter. And look at it, I mean, this is like crazy, interesting, is really not only color similarity, but even the paintbrush uh, strokes and stuff are, are uh, copied. So we said, if you can do it for uh, like paintings, probably you can also do it for biology and we can create artificial images, but artificial images so that we exactly know what we want to see. <clears throat> so we start to collect uh, real microscopy images 
and we said that I would like to have a cell here, here, and here, and here, and here, and then we, we start to generate large quantities of data. We said like here, here, and here a cell, and the machine started to generate realistic looking images. <clears throat> and we, we, we trained our algorithms with these realistic looking images, and then we got the highest score on this competition and, and created the nuclearizer.org uh, page and, and the nuclearizer methodology that actually is pretty much one of the state of the art, if not the state of the art method for uh, um, detecting single cells on, on versatile microscopy images. Okay, so far so good. But we went further. And currently, we are investigating methods that that can generate these false images much better, not only uh, like mimicking the colors, but also mimicking the structure of the like let's say a tissue or cell culture. So we have we work with these guns. Some of you probably heard about these generative adversarial networks. That actually two network. It's it's very interesting. So you can imagine so that there is one agent who tries to lie. And there is one policeman who tries to catch if someone is lying and they are competing artificial neural networks the one try to learn how to lie better the other tries to catch how to understand better if something is lying and in this way we actually converge to something like an artificial reality so we apply two of those methods one to create the structure of the cell cultures or tissues the other is to capture the like color similarities and in this way nowadays we can we can generate artificial images from very little amount of data like this uh, salivary cancer data set and here what i show you the, these are all fake images in the upper side and the bottom side is it's um, um it's it's fake uh, annotation so they, I think they look really, really realistic. I mean, you see it actually even like hallucinates the nucleus there, the structure and so on and so forth. So, so now we have better and better uh, data generation methods than to train artificial neural networks uh, much better. Okay, so one one side I wanted to show you that we 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 are currently working a lot with the Chan Zuckerberg initiative and we build all our methods into the NAPARI, which is the new image analysis software, like um, really uh, flying very high and the community likes it a lot. So we also develop most of our methods into NAPARI. And one, one last uh, segmentation method I wanted to uh, pay uh, or draw your attention to is uh, um, we had a problem a couple of years ago that we had to detect astrocytes on tissue sections. Astrocytes are important because they, they, they give a basis for Alzheimer's disease research and, and, and many other types of research. And the idea was that we would like to count the number of astrocytes. It's as simple as it gets. Uh, and it's as difficult as it gets because because uh, they they look just just very very difficult. So by eye you have a very hard time to say what is an astrocyte and what is not. Uh, so we we thought that we use classical algorithms and they they failed like very very bad. And then we started to also use here uh, deep learning methods, and and we trained a lot. Actually, my my PhD student was training five thousand and then ten thousand cells and. And nothing happened and somewhere at around 15,000 cells all of a sudden it started to work and it started to work so well that we wanted to understand the performance of the deep learning so we asked uh, three of my phd students to annotate the same data set and then uh, uh, a few weeks later we annotated uh, so that we flipped and rotated the images just not to remember that and it turned out that so a b and c were my phd students they were around, so A was the host of the problem. She knew very well the problem. She, she was about 80% accurate to herself. And the others were about 70, 75% accurate to, uh, so not that great. But the D was the deep learning. And actually it was performing as high as, as its, uh, its trainer. So I'm not saying deep learning is any good, but I'm saying that for a very well-defined problem, uh, deep learning can be a super useful tool and you can have human performance uh if uh, if uh, even if 
in case of very difficult questions. All right, so let's get back to my get back to my influenza picture and remember that we turned the influenza cells into a big matrix. Uh, I just made a bit of a detour to show you uh, what are the big questions and what are the big solutions nowadays in uh, single cell segmentation. But now we have a uh, 10 billion times 200 matrix containing all the features of the cells, like size, color, texture, whatsoever. What to do next? Uh, the next one, what we usually do is we do the so-called uh, so cell, classi cell classification, um, and we have a project called the Advanced Cell Classifier. You can find it on cellclassifier.org, where the idea is to, uh, to provide very accurate uh, analysis using uh, machine learning met methods and using minimal user interaction. So basically, you need to spend very little time on, on the problem, and, and it tries to give you uh, as accurate analysis as, as we can. Let me show you how it works in practice. So what you see here is a um, cells from a cancer patient. It was a renal cancer patient. We derived cells and created cell culture uh, out of uh, his uh, uh, sample, and we were testing drugs uh, to find the best drug we can propose to that particular patient. And we, stay, we stained the um, cells with Ki67. This is this green marker here, it refers to uh, proliferating cells. And of course, we would like to find a uh, medication that doesn't kill the patient's cells, but, but, but it also doesn't let them to proliferate. So uh, what we do is we start to train the machine, click on a cell that this is like a positive cell, this is a negative cell, this is some, some feeder cell. And by clicking a lot, we actually can show the machine what is what, and, and then uh, using uh, statistical methods, we can also train the machine to then go and, and generalize uh, the knowledge to other uh, images as well. And in this way, you see that this is a fully automatically analyzed image where we found all the cells, and we judge that like number one class is uh, uh, negative, number two is positive, number three is something else. Uh, these are feeder cells. And then in this way, we can get a very quick statistics about uh, the image or about the 10 billion images, uh, 10 million images what we have. So now we have the tool to actually um, 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 do a high level analysis on our images. And now uh, going a little bit further, um, we said that um, it's okay that 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 we say that that cells are in certain like stationary stages like mitotic or or cancer cell or healthy cell, but this is not really true often case in biology. But cells are always in some sort of transition from one stationary stage to another one, and instead of using this this classical classification to say this is type one, two, and three we can probably use some sort of more co continuous measurement uh, to decide on the phenotypes. So we created uh, an idea called the regression plane concept. The regression plane concept is something like a whiteboard where you can just pin up your single cells. For example, here, like mitosis, we say that it starts from interphase, it goes to chrom chromatophase, metaphase, uh, anaphase, telophase, and, and then, and then uh, the like um, going back to interface. And then we said that that we could somehow learn this as a process instead of uh, like stationary uh, stages. So we created this regression plane. And then now you can annotate whatever continuous biological processes you have in a continuous manner. And you can see, for example, here, a uh, couple of uh, cells, how they are uh, moving around uh, mitosis. As probably you, you recognize that in metaphase they got stuck because metaphase is a longer uh, stage when um, cells are aligning their chromosomes and then all of a sudden they just go and progress and then we can track uh, all these events and other, any other events like uh, differentiation or 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 yeah you you name what all right. Um, and then very lastly, before I go to applications, I wanted to show you um, a, a new interesting research we are into. Uh, the title is, tell me your neighbor, I tell what you are. And what we were asking is, if I know you, and if I know your neighbors, 
is it is this an additional information like think about is that like really i know you and i know your facebook friends can i make like a more detailed profile of you or 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 decide on uh whatever any of your features uh, of course we don't care facebook we care about sales and we were asking if i know the seller neighbor would have a cell can i do the uh, phenotypic analysis better so we said let's let's give it a try and and then we we made a concept so that if you consider one single cell then we define a neighborhood and the neighborhood for example can be like uh, closest neighbors or euclidean distance and then you can say that uh, who are the neighbors of a particular cell and then you can derive cellular features from the neighborhood and we were interested in whether or not we can determine the identity of a cell better than than otherwise so just to sh show you who, uh, two very cool examples the upper one is a cancer cell here it's coming from this environment the lower one is a fibroblast here just coming from here if you look at them sorry they are slightly small but they look very similar and not only similar but their features look very similar if you see the primary features uh, the, like size color uh, and so but if we consider the, the neighborhood you see that there are striking differences in the neighborhood so we incorporated this into the decision and it turns out not going too much into the details that with neighborhood features we get a much much better uh, classification accuracy especially in case of uh, tissue sections we could make um, a very very reliable uh, analysis of the um, of the single cells just using the neighborhood most recently we were thinking about is it somehow possible to e incorporate this into a deep learning method and i was sitting a couple of nights with pathologists and 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 see what what they are doing and what they are doing is they pick a sample they look at 5x 10x 40x like different magnifications they look at by eye and 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 try to make the conclusion and the diagnosis based on like looking at the different scales so i thought that could we somehow incorporate that into like one picture and we started to think about uh, a method uh, which can indeed do that it's called fisheye transformation probably many of you saw fisheye transformation the idea of fisheye is that you see very much the underneath data but you also get a bit of an information from from a data which is far from uh, your origin so considering this picture uh, if we fisheye transform we see very much the cell but we also get a lot of information from its neighborhood it's actually like gradually uh, degrading the information and it, it's if it's very far we don't see much but we still incorporate it uh, uh, inherit it so we incorporated that into our uh, deep learning framework and the result is just amazing so um we, I rather only talk about tissue because probably that's the most exciting one. Uh, with class, classical deep learning, if I may say that, uh, we were able to do like a 95% accuracy in recognizing cells. But with the Fisher transformation, we went up to like 98%, which is like um, uh, from two, uh, sorry, from 5% error, we can reduce it to uh, about 2%. So it's it's like a real, real impactful increase. And, and nowadays we only use like this type of official uh, transformation to det determine the identity of the single cells. All right, so this is all about uh, our science. And now I would like to show you a couple of applications. First, um, uh, one uh, application where we work on leukemic uh, children's uh, blood samples um, to find uh, the best uh, drug. Uh, we do it together uh, with the Children's Hospital in Zurich with Jean-Pierre Botta. Uh, and the the idea is that we take bone marrow samples, we take leukemic cells, and we put the uh, leukemic cells on the top of the bone marrow, and then we treat the culture with drugs or potentially siRNA. And we are interested in the effect of course what we are looking for is is drugs that actually kill leukemic cells but does not harm too much the other cells uh, so unfortunately uh it's not very easy system because we need to keep the cells alive and we need to stain them as well but unfortunately we were not able to find like a one stain which 
for two stains that's separately stains the one and the other cell type. So we use one stain, but that means we digitally need to distinguish between leukemic cells that are these bright spots and the support layer that, that are the dimmer, larger, larger structures. But we, we use deep learning for that. And actually deep, deep learning works very nicely. So we can really distinguish uh, the two cell types just by morphology and intensity. Even in case of very like sophisticated situations where there are a lot of like very dense cells, uh, you are still able to, to get a very decent analysis. So I'm, ve I'm very happy to say that we are already uh, helped for uh, 300 children to find the uh, best drug combination throughout a couple of years. Um, and, and, and the software was used as like a, a decision support system. Now, finally, um, uh, or not, not finally, I still have one other topic. We go to single uh, 3D uh, cultures. So a few years ago, um, a couple of colleagues and, my, and me, we wrote a review paper about three-dimensional single uh, cell cultures and their screening. And it turned out that, that uh, the difficulty here is IT, but there are many other difficulties. And then I decided that in my group, we will build a whole uh, 3D um, uh, screening pipeline uh, for spheroids. And we did a couple of steps towards that. Actually, we, now we have a working system. And I, I would like to show you a case report where we are and what problems we have to solve. So first of all, uh, I'm sure that many of you or almost everybody heard about 3D biology, how much better it is than uh, doing flat biology in a 2D uh, glass surface, that it's physiologically much, much better for uh, um, many uh, like uh, real biological questions than, than, than using 2D. So first of all, uh, if we want to do 3D biology, we need to do create 3D samples. Um, and for that, I have nothing new to report. We use a lot of commercial uh, stuff. Basically, everything what we have on the market, we try it and have it in the lab. Uh, Gravity-based, uh, spherical plate, uh, plate 5D, hanging droplets, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we are able to generate spheroids. And here comes the next and probably largest challenge is that Spheroids are, are very heterogeneous in size, uh, in, in form, and so on. But if you want to do screening, you need to have them uh, very homogeneous. So we built a small um, robot we call the spheroid picker that actually you can put a lot of spheroids. It screens them, and with deep learning, it, it actually finds the spheroids and decides which one are the appropriate ones, and then a small micropipette goes there, picks the spheroid, and puts it into the target plate, which is usually a drug plate. So let me just quickly show you a video about it. So what, what we have is um, a quite simple setup. It's a, a three-axis robot, uh, a, a microscope, and, and a couple of holders. And then what, what happens is that we screen the sample, uh, we find the spheroids, we measure their properties, and uh, uh, then uh, decide on some criteria which are appropriate and which are not for example here the, the area of us. And then um, we come with this micropipette, go down, pick it up, and then put it to the drug or whatever conditions you like. Yeah, so once we have this, the next one, and probably the most difficult one, is the imaging. Uh, so we use light sheet microscopy. Unfortunately, light sheet microscopy is a fantastic thing, but uh, it, it actually requires a lot of freedom because you need to have an objective from the bottom and the top, or from the side and the top, and that actually stops you doing high content screening. But, but let's say you have a light sheet microscopy. Um, if if so, then then you can do very nice 3D images of your cells. As you see here, we have the single cell resolution. I don't know why it's flickering, but believe me, it's um, uh, we can go to single cell resolution. So uh, how to solve the screening problem? To solve the screening problem, my group actually uh, developed um, a, a new technology, a new uh, plate technology where 
high light sheet microscope can also go to high throughput so that you put the, the spheroids in the top of this small pyramids and then in this way uh, we can enable uh like uh, the the imaging uh, of them we just patented uh, this uh development recently so once you have that the next thing is that uh you need to find the single cells and finding uh, them we also we also use uh, deep learning as we used for the 2d uh and here we had to develop a lot of tools for annotation uh, as for example the 3d annotator the segmentation we do also with deep learning um we we even uh, started the startup company doing the segmentation uh, and and some other uh, digital pathology things as well but now we are at a stage uh, that we can detect uh, the signal cells as well from the beginning to the end and phenotype them and just to show you one project that we are working on is is dealing with pediatric brain tumors um, we do it together with the uh, children's hospital in Heidelberg uh, Germany so the idea is that that from um, uh, brain tumor uh, as children we take samples we also create cell cultures uh, spheroids and then and then uh, um, apply some drugs and and see the efficacy of these drugs in a three-dimensional environment okay so this is all about uh, 3d and finally about single cells so so during my talk i was showing you how to uh, flatten images how to find single cells how to phenotype them and then we had a couple of years the idea is that if we can do all these things together then probably we could also we could also isolate those single cells from their environment and we introduced this method called kami computer aided microscopy isolation where the idea is that we take pictures of cell cultures or tissues then uh with deep learning we detect the single cells then with the supervised learning or it can also be unsupervised we determine their phenotypes and then we can tell the machine that i would like to have cells from that particular phenotypes or that particular cell and then we use laser capture microscopy to pick the single cells up and then we could do uh single cell sequencing or single cell transcriptomics or or, or genomics on that already a couple of years ago and then more recently we teamed up with uh, Matthias Manns and Emma Lindbergh's group uh, who are doing proteomics and we designed the concept called deep visual proteomics where the idea is that starting from uh, either human material or tissue culture or cell culture we image the cells detect the single cells again find the phenotypes isolate them and using ultra high sensitive proteomics we can also do uh, single cell proteomics and uh, on, on, on these uh, cells with as deep as 6,000 proteins. And just to show you how it works, um, you, can, you can see here that co contours are detected, the machine goes there, and when there is a flash, then it actually cuts the signal cell out, and then uh, it uh, collects it to usually 384 well plates. Here you see on tissue cultures, cell cultures, and here it's a melanoma patient um, and their cancerous and non-cancer cells. The paper just came out uh, a few weeks ago in uh, Nature Biotechnology, if you want to read more. And then the top of the iceberg, I think, is whether we can pick a single cell, not only from 2D, but also in 3D. And a few years ago, we started to work on a project uh, using patch clamping uh, i don't know maybe some of you heard about patch clamping it's a needle technology that has an electrode uh, at the end and can measure the electricity uh and and in this way the behavior of a single cell mostly used in in cardiovascular and, and uh, uh, brain research so we said that we would like to build a fully automated system that goes into a human brain touches a single cell and eventually measures and picks it up and we built the auto picture system just published uh, quite recently where again the idea is that we have a brain sample it's it's a fresh after operation or injury um, it looks like a spaghetti it's very difficult to, to to see the cells in in here but 
let's say we can do it, we can do it with deep learning, we find that single cells, we can select one particular cell and then control the pipette there. Um, now we are controlling six different motors and then go close, suck it in, break it, and then start the electrophysiological measurement. And at the end, we can just uh, isolate it. And what you see here, the machine automatically selected a, a single cell deep in the human brain, goes there, touches, creates the, con uh, the contact and start profiling that particular single cell so that it was not touched by a human. It was like fully autonomously selected uh, uh, and, and controlled and, and measured. Okay, so this is all about our science. We, of course, we were very active in the COVID research as single cell was a, had probably, you know, single cell research had a very big impact in uh, early times to describe the ACE2, also describe why, why you're actually acquired to use a nose covering mask because the ACE2 is mostly ex expressed in the nasal epithelial cells. We were uh, doing the image analysis for the neurophilin one discovery i don't know if you heard about that this is this is the secondary host factor besides ace2 of the coronavirus um we just describe it with the help of of single cell microscopy and uh, and and what i wanted to show you and this is probably important is we wrote a couple of review papers recently one is about screening one is about profiling the data that was led by Anne Carpenter. One is about phenotypic image analysis. I told you already this three-dimensional review paper we wrote a few years back, actually with a couple of Italian authors as well, about 3D databasing and about nuclear, nuclear segmentation uh, just very recently. So if you want to read more, just, just uh, probably take a picture of this or, or ask for the um, uh, the organizers to send you this slide. And with that, I would like to thank to my Finnish group, my Hungarian group, those who gave money and my collaborators. And thank you very much for your attention.